Whenever you are. We're ready. So final presentation for the day. Thank you to all the Ustream folks that have listened from abroad and everybody here that's stuck around. Uh, Trey Williams from Alabama, right? Most recently, yeah. Most recently. I'm back in Atlanta now. <laughs> You're back in Atlanta. I'm, I'm nomadic. All right. <laughs> Trey. All right. You're up. So thank you, Deb, for letting me come in here today as a as someone who's passionate about franchising and small business and, and developing our economy through business, this is really a, a unique opportunity for me. Let me tell you guys first that I am by no means a social media guru. In fact, I've learned more today about social media than I think uh, I'll ever know. And uh, really what I'm here today to, to talk about is, is your brand and brand positioning. And all day long we've been talking about relevance and content. And, and what we'd like to do now is talk a little bit about how to bring that re relevance to your message. So it's really easy when we're dealing with something online, when we're dealing with something in a virtual space, to forget that, that ultimately we're, we're talking about interacting with people. And there, there's a, this illusion of anonymity online, and, and sometimes that allows us to, to depart from the, the natural way we would normally interact with somebody. So what we're gonna talk about today is, are, are some really tried and true methods of interacting with people on a level that, that builds trust, that builds the engagement level, that builds their interest in what you have to say. And I think you guys are going to find some of these images uh, yeah, pretty interesting. Ultimately, we're all very primal. And I know that might sound a little crazy as it relates to social media, but we have to remember that, that no, no offense to anyone who doesn't believe this, but over millions of years, this behavior has been hardwired into us to make decisions based on certain factors. And we make these decisions without even really thinking about it. We do it unconscious, not unconsciously, subconsciously and non-consciously, we make these decisions in an instant based on some tried and true consumer psychology perspectives. And that's what we're really gonna talk about today. So in order to get you in the mindset of the way I think about things, which is a little skewed and from the left, I'll, I'll, I'll concede that up front, we're gonna talk a little bit and show you some imagery that's gonna make you think the way I think about this. This is a, a ruby-throated hummingbird. So I think it's a beautiful bird, and the reason we're going to talk about it here today is there's some lessons to be learned from the mother of all innovators, Mother Nature. This bird, every year, flies 450 miles from the southeastern United States to its feeding grounds in Latin America over the Gulf of Mexico. Before this big, long, arduous trip, it puts on 40% of its body weight so it can bulk up for this big, long trip. Right? And let me put this into perspective when I'm talking about 450 miles into a 20 mile an hour headwind. This is what that bird looks like. So the reason I'm showing you this is there are a lot, tremendous amount of lessons that we can learn from efficiency, from seasonality, from determination, from perseverance, to scalability all from what has been shown to us is right in front of us that sometimes we seem to ignore. So I'm going to use these metaphors so you guys can get a, a little more visual imagery of what we're talking about. To put this into perspective, what these birds do every year would be the equivalent of me gaining 100 pounds and then walking uphill 16,000 miles without eating or drinking. So I just gave away how much I weigh if you can do the quick math on 40%, right? But, but this bird gains three grams, and then flies all the way across the Gulf of Mexico. So think about that for a second, and if you're not in all of this, and you don't feel like we have something to learn from here, you're, you're not going to like much less of what we have to say either, but if you are, if you look at it, you think, that is really amazing, and I had no idea, I think you're going to love what we're going to talk about. So we're going to start out talking about your brand, and I know that we have a lot of professionals in here, and you guys know this, but just so that we're all operating from the same page, I want to talk about what your brand really is. Your brand is a vehicle. It's a vehicle that can allow you to increase your productivity, your profitability, your awareness, your customer base. But if your brand is a vehicle, who's driving? Who's driving your vehicle to increase your productivity? So when you see this picture, and I'm gonna ask you guys to interact with me because I, I can't just present, what, what do you see when you see this picture? Old. I'm sorry? You think it's broken? unused, neglected, I'm sorry? So, so 
So I look at this, and, and every one of you is correct, because it's obviously been neglected, and I see lost potential. I see something that was formerly powerful, something that increased your productivity, something that you could use as a tool to literally move mountains. But as a result of its neglect, its, it's entire potential has been lost, most likely unrecoverably. It doesn't look like we could probably take this truck and you know, wax it up and put some gas in it and fire it back up and use it. So if your brand is a vehicle, the lesson that we take away from this is you manage your brand and your brand's position from the moment of its inception. You don't wait until you have 15 locations open and say, how should we position our brand in the market? So we're going to talk about brand positioning next. <clears throat> so we want to talk about it as what it is. So what, what is your brand? Well, let's talk about what it's not. It's not your name. It's not your logo. These are definitely part of your brand. It's not your tagline or a website or a color scheme. Your brand is an identity. It's the way that a company is thought about by its customers. It's that space in your brain. When I say, Todd, when I say luxury car, you say, I'm going to tell you something interesting, and, and Beck, Beck is laughing over here, and here's why. I have asked that question hundreds of times. Every time but once, everyone has said Lexus. Last night, Beck said Jaguar. <laughs> she broke my streak, and now I don't have this 100%. I'm so frustrated by that. But think about it. I've, I've asked this question hundreds of times, and every single person says Lexus. What does that tell you about what they've done to position their brand in your brain? And you drive an Infiniti. Exactly. Another luxury car. And not even the car that you drive trumped the, the one who obviously has done a better job branding themselves as a luxury vehicle. Think about the power of that and where it occupies the space in your brain. And then think about your brand and what words you want your consumers to associate it with. You, when I say quality, do you want me to say floor coverings? Right? When I say integrity, do you want me to say tasty light? Or, or maybe when I say yummy, you want me to say tasty light, right? <laughs> but regardless, think about the words that you want to associate with it because your brand is your reputation, plain and simple. It's the reputation that you have in your mind. It might even be your personal brand. It might be who you are that you're building and not necessarily your company's brand, but all of it is your reputation. So we're going to talk about how to manage your reputation. So a while back, I started noticing weird anomalies. I was working in the restaurant industry for years, and I began to notice these, these interesting little similarities from one restaurant to another and things that were happening, like smaller restaurants seemed to be busier, and restaurants that had a, a smaller menu seemed to be thought of in, in, a, in a more authoritative expertise kind of way. And I started trying to package all of this information, and I said, you know, there are it seems like there's six or seven things that really affect whether a restaurant is going to be successful or not as a startup. And I started trying to quantify it, began writing a book, and I was going to call this book Hardwired because I had decided that these were things that were hardwired into us, there was nothing we could do about it, and if, so long as you followed this, it was going to be instinctive behavior that brought your customers in. Well, in the process of my research, I found out that while it, that idea was original to me, it was not original in the world of science, and a guy named Robert Cialdini, who's a professor at University of Arizona, had quantified these years before, and they're called Cialdini's Six Principles of Persuasion. And it's the six things that are hardwired into every one of your brains, whether you're willing to admit it or not, that we make decisions based on, and it's also the six things that you need to use to position your brand. So when you're putting content on the web, when you're posting a tweet, when you're posting a video or a picture to Facebook, you need to be thinking about these six and how that, those six <clears throat> are being incorporated into your brand positioning so that your consumer is viewing you in the same way Todd views Lexus. Everybody with me so far? All right, so let's get to the fun stuff. So why does sponsoring a little, team increase, a little league team increase sales? I mean, you'd say, well, you gave some money, so you know, the parents of the players might want to come there. And here's some other questions. Why do we tend to do what other people do? Here's another anomaly. Why do we do what we've committed to, even if the situation changes? Now, there are some people in here who are averse, adverse to change. 
And for those of you who know who you are, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It stresses you out because you've already committed to something and you don't want to have to change it, even though the situation has changes, but you'll still do it. So why am I, as a born and raised Southerner, less likely to buy something from a New Jersey salesman? No offense to you, Marion. I gotta be honest with you. A, a red-headed Irish lady from Jersey, you just intimidate the hell out of me. I gotta be honest with you. <laughs> So you, I was okay until you said you're from Jersey. I'm like, ah, oh, you'd be nice to that lady. I'm just gonna tell him. I'm sorry. Are you a Jersey girl too? Well, I had no idea. Now you're scary, also. <laughs> but why am I? Why am I less likely to buy from someone who's from Jersey? Why do we care if seven out of ten dentists recommend Crest? What does it really matter? And when we get to Generation Y to talk about this, the Generation Y will say, well, why didn't the other three recommend it? And then, why doesn't Apple make more iPhones? Mm -hmm. There's some just crazy questions, and these, tend to the, the, these lend themselves directly to the sixth principle of persuasion we're about to talk about. Here's the first one. So what do you guys see here? You see a B. So the first one, and the, and the one that I think is one of the most powerful, they they're all show equal power if you take the, uh, the actual science behind it and apply it to percentages. But reciprocity, you know, the bee gets the nectar, the flower gets pollinated. This reciprocity is, is extremely powerful. So I'm going to tell you a funny story. Hilton Hotels was trying to figure out a way to get people to reuse their towels. So they put a little plaque in the bathroom, and the plaque said, please reuse your towel, because every time you do, it saves so-and-so, so-and-so amount of water. Absolutely nothing happened. No one reused their towel. Didn't care, didn't have an increase, stayed exactly the same way. <clears throat> Later, they posted another sign, and it said, Hilton has made a donation to the International Wildlife Fund in an effort to preserve fresh water for our drinking and future generations. What happened? Spiked up to about 35% of the people started hanging it on the knob and started using it. Just because they already made the donation. We've already done it. I've already made the donation. Please just reuse your towel. I'm not saying that if you reuse your towel, then we'll do this. I'm saying it's already happened. So their consumers and all of their guests felt this obligation of reciprocity, felt this, this need to give back to someone who'd already given to them, who'd already paid it forward. In fact, we found that reciprocity alone will increase the chances of someone selecting or doing what you want by seven times. Seven times more likely to choose you if they feel like you've already paid forward something that is, is incrementally important to them in their life. So what does that mean for you? So how many of your organizations partner with a philanthropy? Yep, a, lot, a large percentage of us, right? How many of you post updates about that partnership onto your social media? Good, because what you want to show, and certainly this isn't the reason why you do it, but what you want to show is the meaningful way that you're giving back to the community and that you're creating the payment to the National Wildlife Fund, right? This reciprocity. So if you're, if you're not, please post it. And if you haven't partnered with a philanthropy yet or done something meaningful to, to give back to the community or at least to your target audience within your consumer base, find the way to do that and then post it meaningfully and sincerely to show the efforts that you make. If you're with Habitat for Humanity, show the pictures of everybody with their little tool belts on and their hard hats when you go out and work for them. Do you guys work with Habitat? Is that why you're smiling? <laughs> You just like tool belts and hard hats? <laughs> I thought you got a little excited there for a second, sorry. So, so my point with a lot of that is you've got, and here's the key, you've got to go first. Everybody who's ever put something out on Facebook that says, if you'll like us, we'll give you this, is missing the point. The point is, give it to them and they'll like you. That's what I'm trying to say, and it's one of the six principles of persuasion, and I guarantee you it will work every single time. Remember the book, Give Them the Pickle? Does everybody remember this? If you haven't read the book, it's all about giving people what they want, and then they repay that in spades. If you haven't read Give Them the Pickle, you should read that. 
All right, so what's our next one? Oh, wait. So this was one of my favorite images, and I just wanted to show it to you because I think there's never been a better example of reciprocity that exists in nature. Because you know the first bird that ever tried this, you know all his bird buddies were like, God, what is that guy thinking? And what is he doing over there? And then suddenly when he was healthier because he got to eat more because he's picking all this stuff out of the alligator's teeth, they all get into it, right? So he went first, despite the fact that that's pretty scary. So what do we see here? Followers. Followers? What do you guys think? What does this look like? I'm sorry? So the second principle of persuasion we're going to talk about, and one that's of the utmost importance, especially in the social media world, is social proof. I used to say all the time that there's no better advertising in the world than a line going out your front door. In fact, there was a time when I used to pay people to stand in line in front of an establishment that I was proprietor of so that it looked like everybody was waiting to go inside. And I know that sounds crazy, but it worked. Especially if the people that I paid to stand in line looked like the people who I wanted to come inside. And we'll get to that later, but that's another, another principle of persuasion. But we'll talk about social proof. Who was at IFA and heard Cat Cole speak at the leadership conference before it got started? Just me and Deb and Alyssa? Marion, you were there, weren't you? Yes. All right. Among the four of us, I know that I did this. How many of you went to the wrong ballroom when they said, okay, everybody's going to leave and we're going to go to the crystal ballroom? Do you remember this, Deb? She's not exaggerating. Literally, a thousand people went to the wrong ballroom. You know why? Because the person in the front went to the wrong ballroom. And every one of us stopped looking. We didn't look at the names on the signs. We knew where we were supposed to be going, but instead, our herding instinct kicked in, and we followed every single other person that didn't look, myself included. And we did. We all turned at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the people in the back were so disconcerted because the people in the front were turning around and suddenly it was like chaos. It was like herding cats. It was, it was crazy. And it was because none of us did anything except trust the guy in the front, right? It, it was the most blatant example of social proof I think I've ever seen. It was pretty embarrassing because I followed that person as well. I, <laughs> so when people are uncertain of action, they look to others to figure out what they're going to do. Uh, how many of you are, are the type of person who goes in a restaurant and starts looking at everybody else's plate who's already sitting down to eat to figure out what you're going to order? Do you do this, Ben? You know, you do the little, that looks good, or that looks good, and all you're looking for is the social proof that somebody else in that establishment has already validated that item, and you're going to herd right on in and jump over the edge of the cliff with them, even though this cliff's 40 feet high, and most likely there are many of those wildebeest that will not survive it. The first guy went, so every one of them is going to go. It's just going to be that way. So the importance of this isn't just that everyone's doing it, but it's important to note that it's even more powerful when it's your peers, when it's people that you respect. So when folks are researching your brand and they're looking online, and they see something that someone who they're friends with Facebook says about your brand, who do, they think, who do you think they're going to believe? You or the person they're friends with on Facebook? It's their peers that they're going to look to, particularly in Generation Y, are going to look to their peers. Because they're always going to ask the question, why? Because they have that inherent questioning. And I think that's fantastic. I'm, I'm 38, and I'm hardcore Generation X. If you listen to Pearl Jam in college, you were Generation X. So I know that I'm not Generation Y, and there's a distinct difference between the two of us. I look at the seven out of ten dentists, they look at the three that didn't, right? They want to know why the other three didn't, where I'm like, wow, seven, that's a pretty good number. I'll take those odds. So we see this all of the time with things like stickers on the backs of cars with, with elementary schools. We see t-shirts and keychains. This is the reason why swag is so important at conventions gift cards, rewards for posting reviews for your service on Facebook, anything to get social proof that someone else is using your service to validate what you do. One of my favorite examples of this is, if you ever see the, the television commercials where they are selling you, call now, where they're trying to get you to buy something, and they say this, they say, if our lines are busy, call back. 
That was a recent adaptation because it used to, when I was little, they said operators are standing by. Well, what does that mean? If operators are standing by, it sounds like no one's calling. But if our lines are busy, please call back. I mean, gosh, everybody must be calling. Maybe I should call too. It's, it's actually a, a tangible representation of how it's changed. That happened about 15 years ago, and you'll hear them say that now. If our lines are busy, please call back. So the second question is, what are you doing in your social media to provide social proof to your target audience that validates your service, your integrity, your quality, what you do to attract new customers? What are you doing to validate it through social proof? <clears throat> this is a great example of how, how, how powerful social proof is. Everyone see what I see in the background there? See the crocodile? And look at those wildebeest just moving right forward. There he is, there's a crocodile, but that guy in front of me went, so I'm gonna go. And, and, and don't forget, I know we're talking about animals and you think, well, I'm not that stupid, I wouldn't go in a crocodile. I walked to the wrong room with everybody else. We do this, <laughs> and I'm just using these as metaphors for us. All right, so, <clears throat> What do you guys see here? So, so, so look closely at it. What do, you, what do you think you see here? Think you're hunting? So I have to ask myself why this cheetah is running past all of these little gazelles that are 20 feet away behind them. And the reason is the next principle of persuasion we're going to talk about in its commitment. That cheetah has selected its gazelle. That's my gazelle. And no matter how close I might run to another one, I'm not going to change because I've made a commitment to this gazelle. We do this all of the time. It's particularly powerful from 40 year old and up because these are folks who are set in their ways, who understand what they like, understand what their values are consistent with, what they've committed to. People do not like to back out of deals. They're more likely to do something after they've agreed to it, even if the situation changes. We talked about this. This is why when at the last second, every car salesman tries to raise the price on you. Because you've already committed to buying it, your, 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 your daughter or your son's already excited, we're gonna have a new car, and oh, I forgot to tell you that there's a dealer incentive fee that's gonna add $750, and you buy the car anyway because you've already committed to it. So the point is, how do you use this with social media? You wanna get your consumer to commit to a tenant or an ideal, something that's consistent with who you are. You know, you'll, you'll hear folks ask these kind of questions when they say, do you care about the environment? Hands down, everyone says yes, whether they do anything or not, whether they recycle or not. But asking that question ahead of time and forcing them to say yes, preps them for the next question, which is, we do too. That's why we use low emissions on our lawn care equipment, and that's why you should use us to cut your grass. You set them up ahead of time so that they've agreed to something that you also agree with and they've made a commitment that they don't want to back out of. So you ask questions in your marketing that lead customers to commit to these tenants. I, I even know someone who used to provide a, they, they would come to your house and they were a roofing company and they would give you a little sheet of paper and, and it was a, a paragraph long about how the company has a commitment to their satisfaction. And the whole entire paragraph said, I understand that it's this company's goal to exceed my expectations in every way. It's their goal for me to be 100% satisfied with my product and to have no apprehension about recommending it to their friends and, and relatives. So that did two things. It, it showed them that the company really cared and really wanted them to be happy. But after they signed it, 80% of them told their friends and relatives, I'm ecstatic about it. They did an awesome job. Because they signed something ahead of time that said they would have no apprehension for doing it, they did it. And it was just by getting them to sign that. And there was no trickery involved in this. They really exceeded their expectations. But just by them signing it increased the likelihood that made them tell their friends and tell their relatives, post it on Facebook, et cetera. Something to, ha to know as a caveat for commitment, and particularly with social media, <clears throat> is commitment is related to consistency. Once someone has committed themselves to an ideal, they want that ideal to maintain its consistency. So the voice of your blog posts the voice of your tweets, the voice of all your Facebook updates has to be the same voice because if they commit to one and then they see you have a different voice on the other, they're going to go, hmm, maybe this person isn't as committed as I was. Maybe they're not, maybe they were just pretending to be like me because over here they're not like me. 
So centralize your voice. Make sure that you're speaking with a consistent voice in every one of these mediums or you, you have this fear of fragmentation and this fear of someone thinking they're not like you because you're not like you in every single way. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite pictures for commitment and what it must take for a little bird taking their first flight because they're, they're going to jump and you're either going to fly or you're going to fall. And, and with most folks, they're, they're hesitant about commitment and that's why it's so important for you to make sure that you have that consistency because that hesitancy is well founded. So this is my next one, the next principle of persuasion. And I'm, a, I'm a scuba diver, so I like this picture. I think this is a ton of fun. And um, what I like to say about this is there are no mirrors in the ocean. So each of these fish has no idea what he or she looks like. Never seen the reflection in a mirror. You know, never primped in the mirror, has no idea what their good side is or their bad side, right? They don't know. But they instinctively want to be around those that are like them. So when we were talking about that New Jersey salesperson, I grew up in a town with five red lights in South Georgia. And I don't have anything against those guys, but I'm much more likely to buy something from someone who is like me who speaks like me, uses the same words, maybe even has my accent. We relate to one another on a, on a level that increases the likelihood that I'm going to give that person my business. So think about these fish. It, it, and this is what's even more phenomenal. Their eyes are on the side of their head. Like even if they wanted to take a look at each, themselves, they kind of turn and, you know, it keeps going around and that, you know, I have to go to somebody and be like, can you just tell me what I look like? Because there's a bunch of different fish out here and I want to know who I'm supposed to school with. They don't have to ask that question because they know instinctively and so do we. So pe people prefer to say yes to those that they really like, just like you talked about earlier with Dale Carnegie. And they prefer to say yes to people who are like them. You know, we've all done this. We know, we know which salesperson needs to go to which potential franchise candidate because we know that they have the most in common and the most similarity. We're just quantifying that now to say liking for your customers is very important because what you want to do on your social media is prove that you have consistent core values with them. When you show uh, customer testimonials, you want the picture of the person that looks most like the people that you're trying to attract because they're going to look at it and say, that guy kind of looks like me. You know, I had a shirt like that. I drive a car that looks like that. We probably live in a similar neighborhood and you're going to give him more credibility as a result of that. So, you know, liking for good or bad it is always going to be present. The good thing is, if you do it well, you end up with a picture that looks like this instead of this. So who knows who Frank Abagnale Jr. is? Tell, tell me who Frank Abagnale Jr. is. Uh, this guy is thinking of, uh, he's the greatest imposter. He is indeed. So have any of you ever seen the movie Catch Me If You Can? Leonardo DiCaprio, Tom Hanks. So Frank Abagnale Jr. flew two million miles free, cashed four million dollars worth of fraudulent checks, impersonated a doctor and actually became chief medical officer at a hospital here in Atlanta, Worked for the Attorney General's office in the state of Louisiana before he was 19 years old. He was legal when he did that. He passed the bar, even though he didn't go to law school. <laughs> he, he did pass the bar for that, yeah. legally. But, that was <laughs> but, but the point with that is the reason he was able to fly all those miles on Pan Am, everyone know why? He had the suit. He bought a pilot suit, and he could just walk through an airport tell him that he was making a trip to so-and-so on a red-eye back, and they would let him take the jump seat in the front of the cockpit of the plane, just assumed he was a pilot, because he was wearing the suit. So if you think that's an anomaly, let me introduce you to, to Matthew. In 2010, Matthew was working for a medical transcription company in Orlando. And it's a company that gets all this data and information from hospitals all over the place, and one of the things they did was generate badges for hospital employees. Well, Matthew decided he wasn't really happy with his station in life, and he generated himself a doctor's badge. Matthew practiced medicine at a major medical center in Orlando for two weeks. He prescribed medicine, MRIs, gave shots, diagnosed things that 
I'm, certainly, certainly he wasn't uh, qualified to diagnose. But for two weeks, he successfully impersonated a doctor. And then, let me tell you how he got caught. He went to HR and wanted to know where his paycheck was. <laughs> so I don't mean to be crass when I say this, but someone that stupid who went to HR and asked for their paycheck successfully impersonated a doctor. Why? He had the badge. That's all it took. All it took was the badge. And everybody fell right in line and said, yes, doctor, whatever you think. So when you talk about authority and expertise, what are you an authority on? What is your expertise? And what are you showing your consumers in a meaningful way that you're an expert on? How are you showing them this? I used to work for a, a barbecue concept out of Atlanta here called Shane's Rib Shack. And we always posted YouTube videos of Shane giving hints on, George, on Fourth of July barbecue, on Labor Day, on Memorial Day. Here's how you do this if you want your ribs to come out this way. Because we wanted everyone to think Shane was the absolute expert when it came to making ribs and making barbecue. And the truth is, he's really good. Really, really, really good. But the only way we were going to show that was to post that information in a way that says, hey, he's the barbecue king. If you really want to know how to make great brisket or great pork, here's where you're going to go to find it. So what are you doing when you post to Facebook? when you go and write a blog post to show your expertise, to show that you have authority, to show them your badge. Because when you do, you'll fall right in line. So this is my favorite picture for expertise. So the next time you guys host a discovery day, if your, your brand is a brand that catches mice, you want to show that franchise candidate that you can snatch a mouse under six inches of snow without looking. That's the level of expertise we're talking about. I think this is a beautiful image. And, and, and look at this, not even looking. That's right where it is, six inches of snow, snatches it out inches from the ground. That's authority, that's expertise. So here's the last principle of persuasion and then we're gonna talk about business and legacy. So, so what is this one, ladies? <laughs> So the last principle of persuasion has to do with uh, something that I think we all experienced. So I'm confident that everyone in here when they were in high school started, started having a, a relationship with a boy or girl and, and that person called you all the time, you know, was always walking you around your class, bugging you about where you were going to be, kind of smothering you. Everybody remember this? What, what did you do? What was that? Yeah, you don't want to be with them anymore, right? So does everybody remember that person who really didn't call you as often as you'd like to be called? That person who maybe said, I'd really like to go out with you on Saturday night, but I've already made plans with so-and-so. Everybody remember that person? What did you do then? Then you want it really bad. You're like, I can't believe they haven't called yet. Get your friends to call just to see if he's there or just to see if she's there. So we're talking about scarcity. We're talking about commoditizing your offerings. <clears throat> this is something you may not know. Every year, De Beer, every year De Beers pulls 57,000 pounds of diamonds out of, the world, out, of the, out of the ground. Think about that. Think about how much your little your diamond weighs, right? And then think about how many diamonds it takes to get to 57,000 pounds. It's not that diamonds are scarce. It's that they control the entire world's diamond market. And down in South Africa, they've got a huge vault built under the ground where they keep all of those diamonds. They release only a few a year so that the price goes up and up and up and up because you can't get your hands on them. And they control that. If they took all of the diamonds out of the storage bin and they had, you could buy a diamond for $10 because they have a room, you know, 10 times as big as this filled to the roof with diamonds. They just control how they flow into the market. So the more valuable something is, or excuse me, the, the more something is available, the less we want it, right? We've established that. So how do we apply this to our, our social media campaigns? Everyone knows that we talk about benefits over features, right? Everybody nod with that. We all know this. So temporarily, every now and then, switch your campaign message from benefits to emphasizing the potential for wasted opportunity. This is an opportunity that has a limited window, or here's a product that has a limited availability. And we don't want to do this all of the time because the consumer will grow weary of it. Usually we talk about benefits. But switch it every now and then to commoditize your offering. 
the, one of the most proven findings in social science is people's tendency to be more sensitive to loss than to gain. They're much more concerned about what they might lose than the prospect of gaining something. So by switching this and commoditizing your offering, like one of my favorite places to eat in the world does, they close at two in the afternoon at Pancake Pantry in Nashville, Tennessee, best pancakes in the world. But there is a line, rain, snow, sleet or hell. And they've got a picture inside that shows people standing in the snow waiting to get inside because they close at two. And if you want a pancake, you better get there. They don't stay open all day. And commoditizing their offering creates this sense of urgency where people will stand, and I've done this myself, for an hour and a half just so I can get sweet potato pancakes. And I'm telling you, if you haven't had them, you need to have them. So scarcity is the last of the six. You can look up Robert Cialdini's work online. It's available to everybody. But if you're not using it to position your brand in the minds of your consumer, especially through social media, you should be. This is tried and true consumer science. It's been proven over and over and over again. And we're not talking about being manipulative. We're talking about using what we know to our advantage. We're talking about figuring out who we're like and making sure they know we're like them. Making sure they know that there's a limited offer. Make sure they know you're an expert on a subject. All of these, or that, you know, you know, that you're an authority, all of these are going to, to matter in one way, shape, or form, and make sure that all of your Facebook, Twitter, blog posts, everything is screaming that consistent me message showing this information. <clears throat> so, let's talk about your business a little bit. So me being somewhat of a weirdo when I see patterns between things the way I have, I, I look for examples of franchising in, in nature and in systems that exist that have maybe been around longer than ours. And, and what can I learn from that? So who can tell me what this is? I'm sorry? Is it a coral snake? Is that what you said? I don't know. You tell me. Did you say a corn snake? All right. <laughs> All right, so how about this one? Nope. So both of these are non-venomous snakes who have franchised this brand. That's a coral snake. That's a corn snake, or a king snake, what you might call it. That one's non-venomous, non-venomous, venomous. I grew up in Georgia, so this relates to me. I, they're, they're tiny, they're about this long, so don't be, don't be concerned. I'll get it off the screen in just a second. <laughs> so who can tell me what this is? A yellow jacket. You ever been stung by a yellow jacket? This is a hoverfly. It's harmless. That will hurt you. Let's look at that again. There and there. So one of these is a puffer fish and one of these is a file fish. And I'm not, I, to tell you the truth, I don't know which one because I pulled this offline. They look so much like one another that aquariums often sell file fish by accident to consumers. And people wonder why their puffer never puffs up because it's not a puffer. That's why. Because it looks so much like the distasteful puffer that predators in the ocean won't eat that even we can't tell the difference at first glance. So why am I showing you all of this stuff? Because these designs, these business models, if you will, these franchises have been selected for success. And let's think about that word selected. So I say all of the time, what's the number one reason or the only reason, in my opinion, why a business fails? It's because it didn't attract enough new and frequent customers. And you can say, oh, well, it was a bad location. Fine. It still didn't attract enough new and frequent customers. And you can say, well, they didn't do their marketing campaign correctly. Fine. Ultimately, every weakness could be overcome by attracting enough new and frequent customers. That's the key. Every business fails by not attracting them. The reason I'm saying this, let me see if I can move forward here, is it's about being selected. Much like those designs were selected, when your brand is selected by the consumer, you increase the likelihood of your success. So who can tell me why zebras have stripes? Oh, huh? I'm sorry? No, tell me. 
when they run, they kind of all blur together. So here's a little known fact. These guys are colorblind. So when these guys look the same, they decrease the chances of them being selected. So let's think about that as relation to your brand. So by looking like everyone else, you decrease the chance of being selected. So we talk about meaningful points of differentiation from your brand. What makes you different? What is your elevator speech? Tell me why I should choose you over your competitor is why your consumer is selecting you. And natural selection has shown us this over and over and over again. It's about being selected or in this case, not being selected. <laughs> so you have to position your brand like we talked about and then meaningfully differentiate yourself from your composition in a way that inspires your consumer to select you over your competition.